I am a 2 well. Um, I'm a member of DERP, which is Duke's Immigrant and Refugee Project. And I wanna welcome you all to this event, Institutional Inequality in the COVID Vaccine. Um, just as a heads up for everyone, we are recording this event, so be aware of that, that way people can watch later. Um, and if you have any questions that come up during the event that you'd like to be asked at the end, or, or if you have any problems or anything, feel free to message me directly in the chat. Um, so I'm just gonna give a quick introduction. So first we have Professor Kate Evans. Um, she will be part of our conversation today and then also serving somewhat as a moderator. She teaches immigration here at Duke and is the director of Duke's Immigrant Rights Clinic. Um, next, we have Professor Thomas Williams. He is the supervising attorney of Duke's Startup Venture Clinic, where his academic interest is focused on access to economic independence for normally marginalized communities. Um, he's also the director of the JDMA program in bioethics and science policy. Um, and his work focuses on a number of things, including research ethics. Um, finally, we are happy to have Edith Nieves Lopez here with us today. She is a bilingual pediatrician with 10 years of experience. Currently, she's a pediatrician at the Lincoln Community Health Center. Um, she's also focused on bridging health disparities in patient populations. She's also a member of Latin 19, which advocates for the needs of Latinx community during the COVID-19 crisis. So thank you for being here today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Kate Evans. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, thank you, Dr. Nieves Lopez and, and Thomas as well to you um, for, for joining us. Um, it was, we've had a lot of discussions within these various um, student groups about what's going on right now, um, how, how we can all sort of better understand access issues and also, you know, historical reasons that, um, that a lot of individuals who really need the vaccine might not be going out, you know, and, and first in line, as well as just problems with access. Um, and so wanting to have a really a, a, a discussion about the various ways that um, groups are um, trying to navigate these different issues and how care providers are trying to respond and what opportunities there might be um, to really fundamentally restructure and reimagine the ways that we provide healthcare to overcome, I think, what has become an increasingly recognized area of yet another place of, of systemic racism in which we're looking at years upon years of policies and, and what that means then for individuals today in the context of a pandemic. Um, so I thought maybe if it's okay with you, um, Edith, if, if you might be able to sort of launch us into what does your day look like? What, what's going on sort of with the populations and the patients that you're seeing um, and the communities you're trying to serve? Everybody, um, very grateful for having this conversation in this forum. Um, so my everyday um, with patients uh, related to COVID is, um, I have parents who are at this point unemployed. So income has been affected greatly. Um, I have parents who are struggling to have food on their table. I have a lot of parents who have gotten sick and have ended up in the hospital and um, you know, with severe COVID. Uh, with pediatrics, I'm seeing a lot of anxiety I'm seeing a lot of trauma because of, you know, having loved ones sick. I see kids struggling with schooling, uh, with online learning. Um, some of them don't have, a, you know, basic good internet connection to just log in and have their classes. And the schools have provided some sort of like hotspot for them to connect, but some, sometimes there's three kids in that household that need to connect with the same device. There's definitely the language barrier of I, the moms or the dads can't understand or whoever is taking care of this kid at home has that language barrier so they can be of help when they're taking those classes. Um, sometimes it's grandparents who are not computer savvy who have to be there for those kids. Um, then there's a case of kids by themselves because mom and dad have to go to work and they have to put a plate on their table. So I have kids 10, 11 years old the whole day at home. And um, I don't think there's much that we can do about that because I can't make those parents choose between having food on their tables and you know having a kid attend to school. So it has been challenging communicating with teachers because everything is online or through email. 
a lot of parents don't have an email address. So it, how communications may happen through text messaging. Um, schools, especially here in Durham, um, have a big population of Latinx kids and they don't have enough resources, bilingual resources where they can talk to the parents. Also school hours typically are hours where people are working. So when they wanna address any issue after hours that probably has to be tended you know, afterwards. So there's a lot of challenging, a lot of trauma. Um, uh, kids are gonna be behind in, you know, in terms of like academics. We know for a fact that most kids from marginalized um, communities are at least a year behind under normal circumstances. So we don't know yet what's gonna happen after the pandemic. Um, we've seen a lot of weight gain. I have kids who have gained anywhere from 20 to 40 pounds. So nutrition has been also something that's taking a toll because if you're at home by yourself, mom and dad will eat something, that's a quick fix. Or if you don't have money and there's already food, you know, deserts in your community, you can go out of your way to get something nutritious. So. I mean, every single aspect of what's quality of life for my patients and their families have been affected. Could you speak a little bit to the extent that you see it or you hear the discussions, you know, from the, the parents of your patients, what their experience is with, with respect to the COVID vaccine and trying to figure out if they're eligible, how to get it, what, what that looks like for them? So the first thing I hear from parents is that like basic concepts of the vaccine, like the science behind the vaccine and how does it work? That's a subject that hasn't been delivered to them in a language that they understand, first of all. So we are very privileged. We have access to different sites on internet where we can access and, you know, we have a, a higher degree in education where we could understand that. So. Um, different departments of, of health and the CDC has information in Spanish, but the language, the complexity, it's, it's pretty complex. And then I have patients who are indigenous people who Spanish is not their first language either. So the mm -hmm. terms that they are using to explain the science and statistics, I think it's very difficult to understand, even for me. Sometimes I had to read something a couple of times before I get that concept. So I think it's very professorial, the language. So right from there, and then because they're Spanish speakers, they don't have information in real time. So information is power and they don't have that info. And then I do have some of them who have been able to access good information and they're actually eager, a lot of them, to take the vaccine. Um, they get why they need to get it. They actually get about like herd immunity, which is a percentage of people who need to be vaccinated for this to go away. My patients have been, for the most part, very compliant with masking and very cautious. Um, and then uh, the ones who want to get the vaccine are confused about the different stages or group implementation that the state is doing, which honestly to me too, there's group one, group two, and then there's like subcategories, but there's some ambiguity of who qualifies for what, or then some people do qualify but because they can't speak the language, they can explain to, mm -hmm. you know, the vaccine clinic that they do qualify. So um, having set up a, 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 an appointment for the vaccine is very challenging. Most of the medical centers are doing online. And a lot of this registration um, spots are in English. And a lot of them are associated with big medical centers. Um, there is this thing called my chart where you have access to your medical records that is not available in Spanish. And it's been out there for the last five years for the general population, but Latinx patients can access and understand or navigate this, you know, program that's accessible to anybody that doesn't speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. So it's very challenging when they try to call for like a phone call to set up an appointment there's not enough staff that speak Spanish, so they are left on hold. And sometimes they're waiting for half an hour for an interpreter while there's a scheduling person at the same time waiting for that to translate, to interpret that, that patient's request. So if there's a bottleneck. If even for you know English speaking people, it's been extremely challenging. So for my patients, it's exponentially. There's more and more many barriers. Somebody who's working can just spend half an hour during working hours from eight to five to talk to someone because they need to work. So um, there's a lot of barriers because most of it is set up for technologically geared you know, people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, even if they wanna get the vaccine, there's so many barriers or things that they have to overcome. So it's very challenging mm -hmm. for them. 
Edith, can I ask you, I want to just jump in and ask you a question. I think one of the things that we haven't, um, there are so many, I guess, issues and complications to the narratives that we're exploring um, and creating with respect to COVID. You know, one of the things that jumps out, an old but new, right, digital divide, which it sounds like a lot of what you're talking to and a lot of what North Carolina and other states are experiencing and trying to make education happen for students who are marginalized already um, and that we have not dealt with. And we've known the digital divide has been in existence for 20 or 30 years now. Um, but then also um, this complicated context you talk about around language, around the barriers there, um, also around science communication, even in English, these are like not new things. And so how do we, you know, one of the pieces that feels like it's, that we keep uh, reifying is this narrative of distrust um, as though everything um, around the problems that are happening right now, specifically now it's vaccines, right? That um, folks that look like me, folks that look like you, um, the populations that we serve and think about just don't trust folks. And there's nothing that, right, these institutions um, who hold all this power can do, but these are not new. And so, I guess, can you talk a little bit about how we might better characterize or how we might um, engage in conversations on the institutional level um, to try to seek change? I know you're at Lincoln Health, which for folks who don't know is a federally funded um, health clinic here in Durham that serves a lot of the kind of marginalized individuals. But what do we do with these old narratives, both for you in terms of like treatment and getting word out that this isn't necessarily the true story? Um, but also in terms of holding um, institutions accountable um, and not just about vaccines, right? But in this something broader and bigger um, that maybe we don't have this constant revisiting and retelling of a same narrative without nuance. Yeah, um, that's a great question. I would say using the argument of this trust as the one obstacle for a vaccine, um, you know, immunizing the population, I think that's a pretty weak um, argument on my, on my end. I think at this point is uh, supply, demand, and like chain, it's, it's, it's honestly, it hasn't been coordinated. And then when we talk about this narrative, we have to acknowledge the past that both medicine and science has had for this mistrust. This is not something that, um, why are they mis so mistrusting? It's what have we done that had made it that way for them. And I think one of the most like best examples is the Tuskegee experiment, right? And this is the prime example when we talk about ethics and science and the intersection in like human rights, et cetera. So, um, you know, Tuskegee was something that started back in 1930s. And this was an experiment meant to follow up syphilis. And the goals were number one, follow just for six months and see the natural history of this illness without treatment. And also gather data to justify treatment plans from the black community. So it wasn't justified as they deserve that treatment. We had to have data supporting that. So um, in this situation, this was, you know, the Department of Health, the government, um, uh, university institutions were very much on board with this. So it was in the early 1930s, we recruited close to uh, 400 um, black individuals and that were sick with syphilis and then we have 200 of them that were not infected. So we decided to follow these people without giving them any treatment to see what was gonna happen with the disease. And we, uh, uh, it was presented as they were actually getting some sort of treatment. They were lied to. They were told um, there's this thing they used to call bad blood, which is essentially uh, blood related diseases. So they were told you're gonna get medical care, you're gonna get you know, free food. And then you, if you know, something happens, you can get like covered for like a burial cost. So you know, that was anticipated that some people may, you know, may die. They recruited a black nurse, they recruited black physicians, they got people, from the community that look like them to lure people into this, you know, research. They kept on going with this. And um, in the 40s, we know early 40s that penicillin has, was the treatment of choice. And it's actually the one treatment of choice that we keep using to this day. And once that was available, there was a constant effort to remove these people from seeking medical care. 
whenever somebody wanted to go out of their way to visit another doctor, they were going, you know, making a lot of obstacles or convincing people. Um, this, there was plenty of like reports and like research in journals where at one point they noted that there was no consent form with these people. There were questionings of like ethicals, um, you know, how this was run. And this was as early as the 50s. So this thing kept on going and going and going without um, any accountability. At one point in the late 60s, um, the American Medical Association, the CDC, and then the um, Medical Association that represents uh, Black physicians, they were all National endorsing. Association, yeah. Nash, yeah, National Medical Association. They all endorsed this um, study. And this is actually towards the end um, when there was plenty of questions about ethics. And then uh, finally, a whistleblower, which is a social worker, talked to the AP News, and that's how the news broke out. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of sequela. There were kids who were infected. Uh, syphilis spreads through your body and also invades your you know, um, nervous system. So people were having a lot of deficits. Um, and the last patient enrolled in this study died in 2004, 2004. So this was very recent. And sometimes we think of you know, uh, this type of brutality against marginalized group as something remote and like, very far removed from us. And this was very recent. So we have the children or the grandchildren of these subjects are alive and they remember what happened to their family. So when we talk about vaccine mistrust or medical distrust, there is a background for that. And then I can also point you for like reproductive health in Puerto Rico, my home country. Back in the 50s to 60s, they were studying uh, oral contraception, which we now you know, are benefiting from. And there were women recruited and there was no mention of possible side effects. Um, we were giving them 10 times the, the dose that you need for that. They just kept on pushing. When women came out and com complained about side effects, they were dismissed. They were told that they were, you know, these are uneducated, unreliable. These are the poor of the poorest. There were three women that died and nobody had an autopsy just to confirm how that happened. And there were actually medical students enrolled in this study and they walk out as soon as they uh, start experiencing these side effects. They were threatened to get bad grades from their university. So there's a lot of instances when we have brutalized people and I think there has to be a reckoning in order for us to uh, accountability. This is why it's happening so we can I think in a very humble way, approach how we talk and open a conversation with our population because this is not out of thin air. Um, there's good science, but these people had big, you know, prestigious institutions supporting this. So why should they trust us now? That's so what I think. I, I think you bring up like really great points. I do want to also just um, make sure folks don't rest their hats on Tuskegee, um, that this goes back to Marion Sems, who's considered the father of American obstetrics and gynecology and did really brutal um, experimentation on slave women and anesthetized. Um, but which, and right, in both Puerto Rico and in the work of Marion Sims, we did see solutions that came out of it that speak to a really complicated um, relationship between research and research subjects um, and, and volunteering. And, and who bears the burdens of creating the science that we need to move forward. And so right in this moment, we've seen so many kind of, um, you know, upper middle class, um, you know, white appearing folks sign up for like human challenge trials, which are these trials where they infect you with the disease to see if something works. Um, and, and how that doesn't give us a good kind of honest description of what's happened at the U.S., um, during the Nuremberg trials said you, you should be consenting people, but then years later we saw them um, continue to engage in this work. And as recent in, as the 1990s, we've seen institutions like Columbia University um, engaged in really problematic research studies um, with real problems around consent structure that really targeted um, Afro-Latino and black children um, in Washington Heights and Harlem. And so, and so I just, I thank you so much for all that color around Tuskegee. 
I just also also um, always like to be careful because I think so many people couch um, the conception and structure of mistrust in Tuskegee as though we have to look back 70 or 80 years to understand how we've reached this point, um, where I think, you know, for a person like myself, there are experiences in rooms with physicians outside of research that raise questions around the authenticity and trustworthiness and engagement with medical systems. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you, but what this thing, what this does bring up, I think, to um, that I would love to kind of get your sense of, and which I'm having a really hard time grappling with and wrapping my head around, um, our constructions of race and how they play into the conversations we're having around access um, uh, and whether or not um, how we are, you know, the buckets that we're placing people in, right? Whether then it becomes a question of access and whether you're doing what you need to show up and meet people where they are, versus folks, even if you give them access, walking away from the option. So uh, I was looking at data, um, you know, we've known that I think folks who would, we would put in this Latinx bucket, which is again, a controversy, have historically not always shown up for vaccinations at kind of what I would call the default rate, which in this country is the rate for white people. Mm -hmm. But I'm also really struggling how I figure out how, whether I'm talking about Afro-Latinos um, white appearing Hispanics, folks who are, have been in this country for generations, folks who are recent immigrants or first generation. Can you say something a little bit about this um, dialogue that so many Americans don't quite understand or engage in about the differentiation between ethnicity and race um, and how we might think about some of the questions raised now within that kind of kaleidoscope that doesn't, right? Because we're seeing data that has black people as a group it has Hispanic people as a group, um, which also may not be the right term, right, in terms of who is Hispanic and what that means um, versus Latin. Um, but I would love to hear your thoughts around the data that is missing, the data that we need, but also maybe what healthcare institutions outside of just thinking about race should be doing to augment and better their systems so that people want to show up. Yeah, that's also a great question. So when, when we refer to um, population-wise, we, we tend to classify in either race and ethnicity. So for the Latin X or Latine, which are two terms that people feel more comfortable, um, Hispanic is somebody who speaks Spanish that comes from a Spanish-speaking country. And that would include Spain. And they're not considered part of our you know, group because they're European. So Latinx or Latines are people from 21 countries or the descendants from those 21 countries, regardless of what they speak, because we have indigenous, we have Afro-Latinos, and we have white. So we have the same you know, array of races within our uh, ethnicity. I think there's not, we don't, we typically don't see that breakdown when we look at data. And I think that's very problematic because as you mentioned, every group may have a different set of challenges. Uh, indigenous looking uh, person from Latin America will face different obstacles, not only because of their appearance, right? Also because of the language and understanding the culture. A wide looking European descendant, you know, Latino has privilege and access to means because they're the descendants of people, you know, from typically well off people. And Afro Latins has a different set of um, challenges because they are black in race and they are also Latinx. So I think we need to address them individually. I, we're very often seen as a monolith. We're all under this umbrella of Latinx and we're 21 nations with very distinctive you know, culture. We do share some values as a, as a, you know, as a, as a continent, right? But, we're very different. I don't think we're having those conversations with, with data that we're collecting. Um, I really like the job of Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. He, has, he does a lot of anti-racist uh, work and he's with Boston University as the anti-racist um, institute. And he has written great pieces about how in order to target um, healthcare, we have to look at how this breaks down in order to prioritize who are the people more, more vulnerable with this. So at an institutional level, we have to start just starting by taking the right data about who are we trying to reach? What are the numbers? Where are they located? And in terms of the vaccine, as, as you look things right now, I don't have an idea of who's getting vaccinated based on race. I just have 
Hispanics, or then when you ask for race, it's other, and there's no like multiracial people. In my case, I'm multiracial. There's not a category for that. So that information is extremely relevant. I need to know who am I reaching and who's you know staying behind. And if I don't have those numbers, I don't know how to, in a culturally sensitive way, get somebody to meet them halfway through and we have a conversation. We can't just have a template to just talk to somebody when they're facing different obstacles. Uh, somebody from Latin America has a lot of trauma, right? Somebody from Venezuela or Argentina, they come from very well off families. So we just can't pile everybody under the same umbrella when their challenges are very, you know, varied. So institutionally wise, I think they have to recognize that, that they're not, not dealing with just one type of person. And, and, you know, one of the things that sticks out to me, too, is we also don't know what these individual healthcare experiences are, right? Like if you are a white Argentine graduate student at Duke or immigrant to this country, you've likely or perhaps had a radically different experience with healthcare providers. And so there's other, right, outside of this race stuff, just also... Um, what are your interactions like and what does that equal in terms of your willingness to both show up for care um, yeah. but also to show up for um for the vaccine um do you feel like healthcare institutions are doing a good job at tracking what they need to understand how individuals um interface with healthcare systems and what those outcomes might look like i have witnessed there's conversations happening um there are people that are, you know, there's representation of some of, of um, race and ethnicities having those conversations. Um, at the end of the day, power is typically, you know, concentrated in a group of people that don't actually represent the population they're serving. So I, 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 I heard conversations, I haven't seen concrete policy or stages or plans in place roll out to address specifics about each ethnicity. I actually sometimes have to reiterate that we're not the same, you know, racially speaking, we're different. So I haven't seen anything concrete happening moving forward to address where we're missing the mark and where should we, you know, start addressing some of those gaps. I, I honestly haven't. And, and, you know, the question from that, I was just thinking about um, a relatively negative experience that I had with a healthcare provider, the onus is really on the person who is disenfranchised to raise their voice unless institutions are saying, are you getting what you need and are we meeting the standard? And they're right, you start to wonder about how federal policy making or state policy making um, might be the mechanism when institutions haven't shifted. I don't know if that's the question for today's um, conversation, but but it is interesting that it's been this long. Health disparities um, came onto the map in the early 1980s um, under the Reagan administration during Margaret Hinkler's work. Um, and we are now 40 years deep in, in saying, like, yes, this is a real thing. We are funding research. We have an Office of Minority Health. And yet this is still where we are in terms of like not even figuring out how to properly pull data and ask the right questions um, to be able to go a little bit deeper. Um, I, you know, I guess you've already said to us that we're not seeing nuanced, well-structured engagement with various sections of the community. Um, so we're not seeing kind of targeted messaging to folks for Ven from Venezuela, right? And even then, coming from Venezuela 15 years ago and coming from Venezuela in the last five years is a radically different story. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with the idea? You know, we're hearing a lot about not just um, Hispanic Americans in the Latinx community, um, depending on the language you wanna use, um, but also Native Americans, African Americans, right? It's this kind of pooled dialogue um, around folks either getting really sick from COVID um, facing um, disenfranchisement, disenfranchisement in systems, and clearly for today's topic, right, um, level of vaccination. So in North Carolina, um, I looked up some, some numbers from the Kaiser Family Foundation, it's around 2%. Um, for African Americans, it's around 15%, but in both cases, far lower than their share of the population in the state. Is this a conversation? So we're having a conversation today that's really focused on Latinx folks and, and um, Hispanic folks. 
are these the right conversations to have? Is it one conversation? Um, you know, you talk about the messaging needing to be like bifurcated or right structured in like multiple different ways. What are the best ways for us to talk about this? Is it several different silos? Are there things that pull all these stories together like wealth and class? I, I just love to get your thinking around how do we attack the problem? Yeah. So I don't think in this country you can separate class and race because it's attached outcomes, medical, um, um, you know, education, they're all tied to which racial group are you falling into. And it's very hard if you're in that category to just jump out of that, you know, um, group or socioeconomical group. And that's true, even if you're privileged, I just want to put that out there. There are folks that sometimes will say to me, well, you're, you know, you're middle class, you, you, uh, you're well educated, these don't matter. And we know that that's just not true. Um, that, that class and education and all these external factors do not correct for um, the, the differential health outcomes for people of color um, and for people from marginalized social situations. So I just want to throw that out there because I think it is misconstrued sometimes. Yeah, um, yeah, there's a, a recent uh, piece from 2017 from ProPublica, right? They're talking about um, mortality on Black women and they're 200 and something times more likely to die and there is infant mortality, and this is corrected for educational level, social class, and that also happens to Latinas too. So there's not a buffer or a protection layer, even if you, you know, surpass that threshold of being, you know, financially stable. I think that we as physicians and, uh, you know, the medical class also has to own their biases because we're the ones providing medical care. Mm -hmm. And the experiences for our, the patients we see depend on how we address them. And there's a lot of misconceptions, both in the African-American community, in the Latinx community. These are things happening, like you said, every day. They get suboptimal treatment, even for the same disease. The standard of care doesn't get meet for it. They get disregarded when they have pain. They get a diagnosis are delayed because they're not taken seriously. Um, there's a lot of stereotypes of them not being compliant, or this is why the medication or their treatment is not working. They disregard their, their health. So there's a lot of misconceptions and that's embedded in even in research that we have to read every day. I mean, I'm appalled sometimes with this, the frame, the framework of how we do research, it's very much biased. And this is something that also the medical institutions and physicians have to reckon with. And I think it may sound cliche, but the change starts with you. You have to, when you look at data, how was this collected? What are the barriers for these outcomes? We were placing all this you know, responsibility in the marginalized groups. And now we talk about um, health outcomes like social determinants of health, which is essentially how much are you making? Where are you living? Is there pollution? So um, this conversation, I think, has to happen within our circle of physicians, and we have to change the way we practice medicine. A lot of what we do on the standards are based in racist, um, you know, data or misconceptions to these days, like African-American women have a higher threshold for pain. Culturally speaking, well, all Black people, right? Based on yeah. the pain study that came out a few years ago, um, I have thicker skin and yeah. can just handle more pain, right? Which yeah. there's all kinds of trauma that comes from that. You know, it, it, it kind of speaks back to the idea of we need feedback loops and better information collection. Um, and your research question, I think, is imperative. We talk a lot in my research ethics class about um, the possibility of um, about who gets to ask questions in research, right? Um, and this goes back to kind of what data you collect. Now, the interesting piece for obviously for um, folks of Latin descent is this question of um, the dogpiling of like the more, for lack of a better term, common, right, um, outcomes that are, come from marginalized life. Um, but then there's the dog pile of immigration status for many folks who are Hispanic American. Um, you know, I happen to have the privilege of knowing a lot of folks who are Latinx, very privileged Latinx folks, and, and the level of stress they live under connected to immigration status, even when they have all kinds of privileges, it's just one that you don't have to think about for many of us. And, 
Kate, I was wondering if you could maybe talk to us a little bit about something that's been in the news for the last couple of years, which is the public charge rule and how that might play a part in some of this or how we should think about that kind of dog pile effect. Yeah, yeah, and I can um, I can sort of speak at a high level about um, what the, the policy changes are and then what the rhetoric has been around that, which are two different things. Um, and then, you know, um, uh, Dr. Nieves Lopez, maybe you can talk about how you're seeing this actually show up in the in the patients, you know, and their parents in the office, because I think that's, you know, really the important piece of this. Um, and so, you know, part of the Trump administration's um, uh, policies around restricting immigration concerned, you know, they, they made changes to the public charge rule, which is this idea, and it's been in our on our books for you know, more than a century, to say that you you can you cannot come in and immigrate to the United States if you are um, going, if you're likely to become a public charge, meaning dependent on government services. Um, that has been restricted in terms of like what government services are considered in the analysis of whether an individual would become um, under the law a public charge um, to cash-based payments, really, really limited set of um, government support, institutional care that's government um, provided. And the Trump administration um, announced very early on, and it, it was leaked soon after um, President Trump um, took office, this new rule and this new intent to really sort of expand the, the kinds of things that would be considered under this rule. And so like, you know, initially it was initially the version that was leaked included any sorts of services that were received by your US citizen children. Um, and so that became very concerning. Services that um, were related to pregnancy and care for infants, it sort of had this, this very, very big balloon of things that um, the initially people thought were gonna be included in the rule. Um, when the rule came out that was gonna expand this form of, of restriction on immigration, it was less than what, what initially had been leaked. Um, and then when the final rule came out, it was even less than that. Um, and so in the final rule, there are a lot of considerations about different factors that are, that are sort of given points about your age and your employment and your um, assets and your likelihood of, you know, supporting yourself um, uh, if, you be, if you come into the United States, your education level, in addition to looking at usage of, of an expanded set of public benefits. But in the end, Generally, if you're not eligible for the benefits, which, which is quite restricted um, uh, for people who are not citizens or long time green card holders, lawful permanent residents, um, those benefits don't count against you. So basically it's like, a, you know, the, the, the set of people who could access a benefit that would ultimately hurt them is very, very, very small, um, especially in the healthcare field because pregnant women and infants were taken out of that final rule so that none of those benefits count against you. Hey, can I ask you a quick question? I'm sorry to interrupt. Do, do folks understand that stripping down versus the exactly. narrative? Exactly. So that's, that's just what it, you know, the, and the benefits to U.S. citizen children are also not counted under that final rule. But I think the, the effect of what was initially included for years and years, I mean, more than probably two to three years of press coverage, you know, of advocates who provide those healthcare services for caseworkers who are trying to enroll people for immigration attorneys, you know, was not understood or not known. And so there, there has been, you know, a very, um, the effect has been that people are very concerned about any kind of service for anyone in their family, regardless of sort of the scenario. Um, and breaking through that kind of concern about, oh my gosh, whatever I do in the healthcare world is going to impact my immigration situation. And that, you know, and I think that there is probably some intentionality in announcing a rule that was very broad, um, you know, and, and having this very, very significant chilling effect on the uptake of care for people who are entirely eligible 
for whom that care and that support has no impact um, on the immigration side. But it has been, you know, it has been a nightmare in terms of outreach to, to communities on this changing landscape, you know, with respect to the rule, um, outreach to immigration attorneys, to public health advocates, to people in schools that are enrolling people in, you know, school lunches, like just all of it, right, is sort of swept up in this, oh my gosh, I'm so afraid and I don't want anything to hurt me in terms of the stability of my family and our, you know, existence in the United States. And that's com compounded at this time with a very explicit um, uh, you know, messaging from the Trump administration to say, if you're here without authorization, we're coming for you. And we're gonna start, you know, we're gonna try to access every form of information we can in order to find you. Um, and so you have this, this concern about what services, any service I use is gonna hurt me and anybody I give my information to is going to end up in some kind of immigration enforcement action. And so those two sort of, you know, those are re really two separate, very fundamental sources of distrust that I think combine to make it incredibly difficult on top of, you know, all of the very important, much deeper issues you all are talking about to reach communities, to reach immigrant communities, to reach Latinx communities right now to say like, oh, forget the last four years. Oh, and also everything that you've just heard about using public benefits doesn't apply to you. What's your name and your address? Don't worry. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a scary prospect to walk into coming out of the last four years. And it's existential. Am I wrong in saying that's like an existential threat for many folks? I don't want to speak out of turn, but I think again, like a lot of Americans are not used to the kind of intensity of of um of situation i guess that leaves you in yeah i mean absolutely like trying to sort of parse the like you know what are the actual risks under the law for any given family or any given situation you know that that is lost right um it it just is a sort of anything that you use as a benefit to support your family and a public good is potentially going to hurt you in the way that you know one of the most fundamental ways you care about you know in terms of the stability of your of your family and what you're trying to achieve here and so overcoming that i think is just a an enormous barrier you know edith you and i have been emailing a little bit about this too and i'd love to just you know hear what what you see sort of on a day-to-day -day there yeah um another excellent point i think we have to remember that this country hasn't been um nice to immigrants as a whole. And even before this last, last, you know, sadly four years where there's a lot of harassment and it was re-traumatizing. We have to understand that immigrants already come from a traumatic experience and they go through hell to make it here. And then once they get it here, they are persecuted, right? So as you're saying, there's this concern as uh, livelihood, uh, getting out of their houses every day. I consider that an, an act of bravery because you're under siege, um, it happens. They can pull you where you're working. So, I mean, there's a lot of trauma and these last four years haven't necessarily made it any better. And like you said, the public charge has become something that people, they don't wanna take any type of services that they are, um, they can you know, benefit from because they're concerned of those, like almost points taken out of their applications. There is a lot of mistrust when you try to clarify the same taking going back to the point of if you don't qualify for that service it's okay because you're you know you're not going to be able to get it anyways but if you do please take advantage so moms are doing prenatal care very late in their pregnancies just because even though that's a service that is for every single you know person in the U.S. they're concerned about reaching for that because they don't want to hinder their process. Wick is something that I get a lot of parents telling me, no, we're fine. And I can tell that they're struggling. Um, food can you stamps, just, sorry, for, for folks who aren't familiar with WIC, will you just clarify what that program does? Sorry. Yeah. So WIC is the women and infant uh, children's. It's a way of supplementing like nutritional foods. It's almost, it's like food stands but geared towards moms and kids. That's a federal program that regardless of your status in this country, you qualify for so it's um, supplementing those um, people with 
you know, fruits, vegetables, you name it. There's like a list of, of um, foods that they can, you know, um, qualify for. So that's something that is basic, that sometimes it's maybe what they would have as, as a meal because they're struggling financially and they're refusing to apply for those. Um, also like school meals. And I, I try to, you know, convey the point of this is something that's not gonna hinder your process, but there's been so much trauma and so much, um, just they have seen people's experiences, you know, roll in front of their eyes. It doesn't mean like there's something legal, you know, written in paper that things actually are how they are, they're executed. So they may have heard somebody that maybe took some sort of help and they equate that to the ones that they're gonna take. So um, they're falling between the cracks when they really need those services because they're struggling. Starting from prenatal care, which is very important for, you know, overall health of your, my patients, until just basic, you know, needs and eating, they, they're refusing, they're, they're very traumatized. So it, it's hard for me, like Kate says, just convince them after this much rhetoric of like four years of just harassment, it's, it's harassment pretty much. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that just completely, in terms of like whether or not we are in the same bucket or not, this, is, this becomes radically different, right? Um, and so, <sighs> I mean, how do you even wrap your head around like not having enough food and having access to it, but being so scared? And we know for little people, right? Food, like nutrition matters long-term, um, mm -hmm. right? We have research that says it matters for how much you'll make in life, but also your educational attainment. Um, do you, I guess, do you have thoughts around how we maybe think about what you just presented to us? How do we, how do we disconnect the narratives, which is a much harder task than just trying to get people vaccinated, right? It's, it, this feels like a bigger cultural moment where we have some real, real work to do. Yeah, there's been issues with immigrant, uh, immigrant community where they've been asked for identification forms, which is totally something that the state has made clear that we're not supposed to ask them for any type of, they may ask them for an address or a phone so they can follow up for the second dose because both Pfizer and Moderna need a second dose and that's for them to reach them. But again, how do you convince someone that that information is not going to be used against them as follow them to see their, uh, you know, their status in the country. So that's an extra roadblock for us to overcome. I wish I had the answer for that. Um, I think there needs to be a lot of advocacy and like safe spaces for those um, vaccine clinics to happen. I would like to mention along the same lines, um, Dr. Uh, Rashida Monroe, she's an African-American uh, pediatrician at Wake. And her approach has been going to churches and recruiting patients for those clinics, um, reaching out to their pastors or community leaders or like leaders of faith. They have been very successful. About three weeks ago, they recruited 1,700 people because these patients feel that there's somebody they can trust. This is a place that they're used to going that maybe transportation because this is a community and a lot of social advocacy and social change happens actually in churches, right? So I think her approach was something I was very impressed, but I'm not surprised that a black woman was doing that. Um, she has had very successful outcomes because she is reaching out to a network that's established and people that this community trust. I think again, us as physicians, just because we're experts or scientists, we just can't expect people to trust us. We have to come, you know, and, and reach out to those who do have trust in the community and try to get them on board. Um, I think she's done a great job. And I think that's a good approach that's been effective with the African-American community in, in South Raleigh. Yeah, and barbershops are places that we think about that folks have become, right, advocates, you know? And do you have thoughts? I'm just thinking out loud about J&J &J being single dosage. Is that also a game changer in, folk, in terms of folks getting vaccinated once we have access to market? And should we be thinking about um, folks like those in the Latinx community having access to J&J &J more so since it's single dosage and you might not have those questions of tracing address and that kind of thinking? I think that would probably be a, a game changer. Um, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine are an example of um, health inequities. These vaccines have to be stored at big academic centers on sub-zero temperatures. Negative 90, I think. Yes. So right when it came, when it was approved, the first thing I thought was, how are we going to get this vaccine to remote 
communities. So this was already marginalizing people because the chain of like distribution, serving those vaccines, the amount of supplies you had to buy a minimum of a couple of thousands uh, with the Pfizer and the Moderna, which is Moderna is a bit easier, but transportation to those remote locations where you have farm workers or you have you know Native Americans. So I am hopeful that the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, which is you can you know have a room temperature for actually quite a long time. And in the, uh, you can have in the freezer for two years. So it has a longer life. It's easier to dispense. It's a, a single vial. It's $10. It's much more um, accessible price-wise. Um, they're not making any profits, actually, with that vaccine. So I think that's going to be a game changer because you should be able to vaccinate a large segment of the population and hopefully get herd immunity, which is having a lot of people vaccinated, which stop the spreading. And it's a good point that you won't have to follow with somebody. So it's like, a hit and run situation where you have somebody covered and you don't have to call them back. So I think that would be, I think a great, you know, it's a, it's a good way to think in which I wasn't thinking in legal terms, which yeah, it's, it's, I think it's gonna be a game changer. So like, let's talk about that some more, right? Cause part of what we have to do is to be like, right, create new solutions. Like, and maybe we need to write to folks in Raleigh and say, let's make sure J and J is routed to um, immigrant populations primarily since we know that these issues they face. Are there other things, you know, our students are law students, um, they're policy advocates, they work in places like the Immigration Immigrant Rights Clinic and the Health Justice Clinic. Um, you know, we, we take a different take, but what can students do? I know you were talking a little bit about um, phone banking and trying to make sure people are aware and able to access. Um, Kate, I would also love to hear your thoughts, but how can our students, right, rather than just sit in on talks, which at this point, it feels like a narrative and a conversation we've had over and over again for a year, how do we get them on, on the ground and doing tangible things that change the situation? I, I think we can connect them with people who are already, already on the ground. There's already grassroots on, you know, nonprofits who've been doing work in the community before the pandemic happened, right? So there's a lot of well-known organizations, both for um, the Black community and the Latinx community that if, if you guys are interested, I can give you a couple of names and a couple of contacts. Absolutely. I would, I would probably join um, well-established organizations, the ones that have very, they're rooted in the community. And I'm sure they can use your help and your expertise and probably some advice from the legal aspect, which sometimes we get lost because we just think about science and medicine, but logistics, like you said, about concerns about legal status and, and those type of issues, um, we can definitely provide you information. Um, donating for those institutions is also a good way. You don't, sometimes we don't think about financially how you can, you know, impact communities, but there's a lot of people who were there before we showed off that they've been working with, you know, decades with these communities and we can join their efforts. That's what I would do. Join, uh, uh, a system that's in place already to help them, you know, move the needle instead of like fragmenting. It's, it's easier to just join forces. That, that would be my advice. That's great. I think also don't forget your individual voice. So I should at Duke, when I go to Duke Med, say you guys should be getting more information from folks on the back end of their patient experience and including mm -hmm. questions about race and about um, physician interaction, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I should probably, again, maybe I need to ask you, Edith, to sign a letter with me and Kate um, and get students involved to, to say like, let's think across medicine and law about mm -hmm. how these things link up in the science works. Kate, did you wanna maybe get um, a last word in? I, I mean, I, I think these are great. I, I think, you know, one of the other things that um, I consistently see and, and is solidarity funds and something that is, it's not specific necessarily to like vaccine access, but sort of recognizing these persistent inequities, you know, in who has to go to work. Um, and even when they're unsafe or what the, what the sort of um, lack of safety net is really if you can't go to work. Um, and so those solidarity funds have become, I think, um, a real, uh, you know, just a real sort of crisis response. Um, I, you know, we have clients that rely, that have, 
have really needed that. Um, so I don't, you know, I want to get out of that. I don't think that's a band-aid approach that just sort of is like exists because of multiple levels of failure, but it is, you know, a place of like dramatic need that really impacts people's lives when they don't have somewhere else to go um, for those kind of emergency needs. The, the, the project that we're also working on is sort of we're trying to help folks that um, are getting uh, are having having contact with a community health worker, and then you know for us anyway are saying like, oh my DACA's expired. I'm about to lose my work authorization. I'm about to lose my driver's license. You happen to be here. Can you help me out with that so that you know I don't have all these other effects going on in my life? So we've got Derp is, has a project where we're getting through the COVID nineteen. Latin 19 outreach, we're doing the referrals on the DACA side to help people stay in their jobs, stay with their driver's license, avoid those problems of getting pulled over without a driver's license and try to keep that immigration enforcement system out of the mix so people can focus on their health. That's, I mean, that's amazing, right? That kind of secondary point of entry, like what else do you need? Um, thinking across again, like science into like what the actual science means, given the problems that are in front of us. Um, so that it's a great uh, note to leave on, right? That there's hope and that we can create um, meaningful solutions, students, professors, everyone working in concert. So um, Kate, I feel like we're, we are switch hitting on the moderator role, but do you want to maybe close us out? Um, no, thank you guys both for, for having this conversation. It's been a real privilege to be part of, and I'm really, um, I'm very happy, you know, uh, Edith, to, to meet you on screen and hopefully continue all of us working together as well on um, these great relationships to have. And Thomas have an opportunity to, you know, have this, have wow. this chat, you know, in a more formal way, in a more informed way. And it will certainly broaden and change my teaching. And I think I'm not kidding about that J and J letter. I think that might be a really important for us to think about um, mm -hmm. in terms of rollout. Yeah, mm -hmm. vaccine equity. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate your time over lunch and we will stay in touch. Yeah. Thanks for organizing, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.